Take me home, country roads, to the place I belong. Tararua, Aotearoa, take me home, country roads. Hi. My name's Megan and I have decided that today is the day. I cannot put it off any longer. I'm going to join the conversation and talk to anyone who wanted to listen about some of the crafts that I do, which are mainly knitting. And um, I really hope you'll bear with me because uh, it's quite complicated getting all the, all the technology set up. You wouldn't believe how precariously my camera that I don't know how to use is balanced on a music stand and so on and uh, I've been sitting here and I've had to move everything because the sun's streaming in here and uh, who knows hopefully you can hear me that's a big thing uh, I'll try not to mumble too much with my good Kiwi accent so my name's Megan and um, I'm coming to you from a teeny tiny town of a whole 100 people uh, in Pongaroa, in the Tararua district in uh, the North Island of New Zealand. And I've been really, really enjoying what people have to offer with their podcasts, um, with, their, with their knitting and their crafts, and I have found it, being quite isolated out here, I found it very comforting to know that there are people who are as fixated on their crafts as I am, and uh, so I thought, well, I might just see if anything that I have to share and offer is of any use to anyone else. Uh, um, and if not, maybe it would just give me somebody to talk to. <laughs> um, right, so I, I, a little bit about me. I, I'm an ex-opera singer and music teacher, singing teacher. And um, I did that for many, many decades. That was my passion. So I obviously have a tendency to hyperfixate on and turn hobbies into absolute passions. And um, I've always been someone who only really likes to compete with myself. And I had got to that point in my career where I'd probably done a lot of my best work and probably while I was doing post-grad and things like that, because when you're, when you're performing um, as a student, you're in a structure, you know, you don't need to make money, you don't even need to call in audiences, you can do very, um, like, really wonderful work that only appeals to a very small number of people, and, uh, and because of the structure of the university system, you know, you will get people, the right people who want to see what you do will come. But then when you're unleashed into the real world, it becomes about marketing yourself. And I have to say, I just as a personality type, I don't like to do it. This, is, this sitting here and actually thinking, gosh, shall I wear my glasses today? Or shall I put contact lenses in? Is not really my natural... Um, comfort position, you know, worrying about what other people think is really hard for me and um, because I worry enough myself and I don't need that input. <laughs> and uh, so when it came to music, I, I, I just got to a point where I was uh, having to uh, make people like me and there is a part of me that rebels against that a lot, uh, having to consciously do that. I just feel that um, life is so short to have to push and if you're good at what you do that should be enough but it's actually not um, it is uh, who you know <laughs> and how you make them feel about themselves that um, tends to make it work I'm absolutely certain that I'm looking at the screen here and I should be looking over here um, I do apologize I will learn so much over the next uh, few filmings and hopefully that will all come together Anyway, so I, I was living in the capital city of Wellington, uh, of New Zealand, uh, Wellington, for many years uh, doing that, and 
then um, I met my partner and we decided that we just were having a full midlife crisis and would have start a new life together and we wanted land and we wanted a sense of becoming more self-sufficient, more independent um, and taking the pressure off because we're both quite creative people and we like to work hard on things that we enjoy and um, uh, living in, in Wellington is a very expensive city to live in so we were really really doing a lot of grind for a lot of other people in order to pay the bills and not necessarily have enough left over to or even energy and time left over to enjoy people and our life and so on. So we bought some land out here in Pongaroa and we have six hectares. Uh, I think that's 15 acres, uh, maybe a little more, I'm not sure. And we have sheep and a goat and a dog and a cat and looking at getting some chickens shortly and we have five cows and we're about to get 30 more cows and um, excuse me and that's our, our life uh, we my partner makes fijo cider and fijo jam and um, we have a massive freezer full of uh, wild meat that he hunts and uh, some meat that we take off our farm and I have much wool <laughs> a lot of wool so my my house is full of uh, wool sheep wool uh, and quite a bit of alpaca which is gifted to me by neighbours um, who are excited to see someone using it and I have taught myself to spin and I do a lot of knitting and I make rugs and I make quilts and I do cross stitch and I do a bit of renovating furniture so basically as you can imagine my life and my house is full of little piles of half finished projects um, which I do get to finish, but you just have to have some things that are, are new cast-ons and some things that are whips and some things that are nearly finished finished objects and then a lot of finished objects that you wear obsessively. So that's that's me. That's my life. Um, that's what I do. I have a few part-time jobs. Uh, and um, But basically, I think about knitting. I dream about knitting. I dream about colours and yarn and patterns. And uh, that's... That's absolutely what I do. It's my happy place in my head. And if I could do it for 14 hours a day, I would. And sometimes I do. I just have to keep switching projects. The other, the other reason to have a lot of different crafts and a lot of different projects on the run is um, just for the, for the sake, of, as you get older, particularly perhaps, but just for the sake of avoiding injury because there's a lot of... I play the piano as well quite badly. And... Um, and I just find myself doing an awful lot of work with my hands and needing to give them a rest every now and then. So that's enough about me. That was quite slow, but uh, I feel encouraged because I have watched a lot of very long podcasts. So what I have decided to do for this, because I have so much to show you, I'm not going to try and show you at all. I'm just going to show you... A, one or two finished objects and uh, a few of my whips but not all of them and that's it and then I will fill in the gaps as we go along and as you get to know me. Um, I, I really think of uh, my crafts as a way of expressing myself, a way of avoiding perfectionism and I do get a great sense of value out of it and I love making things as gifts for people as well I have this weird desire to make every person in the world warm and well dressed <laughs> um, with handmade handmade goods so um, firstly I should start with what I'm wearing now you will not believe this but this is actually a no frills sweater by Petite Knit the pattern um, I will just see if I can stand up and show you it I now, my, my camera keeps stopping, so uh, I have no idea why. I'll learn that. I'll work it out later. But uh, I have these rather artistic details on the sleeves, and the shape of it does not look like a no-frills sweater. I'm sorry, petite knit. Um, <laughs> but love the pattern. 
but I'll start with talking about the wool because uh, this is uh, I hand spun this alpaca um, so this is the natural color and uh, it was given to me by Penny Tinsley down the road and uh, I mixed it with about 20% but it's give or take um, of, of some brown sheep wool and that's why you can see these um, kind of cool variegated streaks in here that's um, that is very soft and very warm so it's Suri alpaca um, it came to me very much smelling of the alpaca <laughs> and um, washed it in a sink and so on and, and hand carded it because at that point I didn't have a drum carder and uh, when I I did a gauge swatch which was quite adult of me I think and uh, I think my my wool was uh, my, my swatch ended up 16% bigger. Does that make sense? So it was 11.6 centimetres for the right number of stitches, etc. And rows instead of 10 by 10. And so I, um, but I, I didn't want the, I didn't want to go down a needle size because uh, it was already quite thick and quite warm because the wool's obviously just a bit thicker than it's supposed to be um, because it's my spinning and I'm, very self-taught off YouTube and uh, you know you get what you get and it's a little bit random anyway as I go through the each each bobbin and you know it depends on my mood as to how fast I I go and if I'm going quite quickly often I'll, my wool will end up fatter um, but anyway uh, there we go uh, so I decided to do basically knit a different size um, I worked out my bust size, which uh, I'm not even going to tell you. I know I'm supposed to, and not mine, but um, and I basically did one that was 16%, a size that was 16% smaller. Yeah, that's what I did, and all of that worked out quite well. And I did my first tubular. Was it a tubular cast on? I can't remember now. Um, Oh, there's a hawks uh, outside. I'm just wondering. We haven't got any lambs yet, so uh, hopefully, hopefully it's uh, just getting a rabbit or something. We don't like rabbits here. Um, yes. Uh, or do hawks eat eels? I'm not sure. Um, sorry, my size. It went down size. Tubular. Uh, I think it was a tubular cast on. Is that a thing? I'm, I'm a little bit amateur, I promise you. Um, and then, I, first time doing German short rows. In fact, was, this was the first ever sweater I've done in the round top down. Um, so I've, I, I bought myself some Chao Gu interchangeables just for the uh, experience. And, um, yeah, started knitting. And I think the, the body's all fine, actually. I'm quite comfortable with that. But as I was doing the sleeves feeling quite uh, like I was on, on, on the home straight, I realised I, I got to here and they were just that big, they were enormous. And I'm a little bit lazy, I couldn't even be bothered going back and doing decreases and I'll be honest, I, uh, I'm just, every project I do I'm learning something new and um, I hear people talking and it's like, how do you know how to do that? I don't know how to do that. But anyway, so I didn't want to change the pattern too much, but I just got to the end and I went, right, that's it. I have to do lots of decreases because I want a reasonably fitting cuff. And so I did this massive decrease like, like this. So they're kind of almost balloon sleeves, but uh, unevenly done. And I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool effect. But then I, I sort of showed my partner. He went, I don't think you, I think you should undo it. I, I don't think you're going to be happy with that and I was like how dare you not support me in everything I do um, and I was terribly upset and it went into the naughty corner for a day and then I went no I am actually I don't care it's not like it it's not like it's a, a dress sweater to be Ooh, I am big doing, wearing it on the internet but you know I could wear track pants on the internet let's be honest and it's fine um so yeah I just then I decided to just cover it up with some this is some more alpaca from the same lady different different animal obviously and I, I'll just pull that a little bit so pulling off um yeah I just I just did a little bit of embroidery and that'll do
that'll do. And next time I, I'm i learning, uh, I'm becoming more and more experienced. I've been spinning for two and a half years, but I have never spun commercially bought fleece or anything like that. We literally have taught ourselves to share our sheep and at, at our, our most stocked so far, we've been here for four years now, at our most stocked we had over 70 sheep and my partner and I were uh, sharing them ourselves. I'd say we were sharing them badly. We were sharing them very, very slowly. <laughs> Um, firstly, because I, I just like, I don't want to hurt the sheep, and I just, I have an absolute horror of um, hurting them, and cutting them at all. But uh, also, because we don't have the right equipment, but we're slowly building it. We've, we've built a barn now at, that has power, and we're just about to set up a proper shearing plant, and um, with, a, with a proper hand piece and things like that, just to make the whole process much easier and it's already easier because we were doing it out in the paddock with a generator a petrol generator and you know a big heavy um uh what are they called the clipper things um handpiece with with the motor in it so it was almost too heavy for me to hold and use and with a power cord which is always getting in the way so um hopefully things will get easier in that in that on that front so that's the kind of wool i'm using absolute amateur wool from our mongrel sheep i love our sheep they've all got names but um <laughs> except i keep forgetting their names and then when you share them they all look different you can't tell them who's who anyway so <laughs> i just kind of make it up now they're just called the girls uh generally the girls and the boys we should only have one ram but we're just um <laughs> somehow or other we've got three or four at the moment and they're all beating each other up all the time and really i need to get one in the freezer but I'm sorry if you're vegetarian but hmm. <laughs> we're not here uh, right so that's the first finished object um, I have a few others sitting around me uh, one I finished this week oh no there's one more I'm wearing I'll start with one more I'm wearing and that is uh, I made some scrappy socks Oh goodness, I hope they're clean underneath. <laughs> I only finished them this morning, so hopefully they still are. Um, yes, so uh, these are a DK weight sock, um, and it's about the eighth pair of those I've made, but it's the first time I've ever done stripes, and I just had this incredible desire to make a little bit of space. I, I love watching those stash busting and stash organizing videos, and I only have two drawers with wool in it, in them and I just like to use them there's no point having a whole pile of wool out there so I'm sitting in there so I just uh, started using some up and I really quite enjoyed it and I love the effect and they're going to be good around the house warm very very excuse me warm socks um, so that's number two the pattern for that is uh, uh, they're a Gallipoli sock so um, they're from um, like sponsor, a new, it's a New Zealand wool and pattern, and um, they've um, been sponsored or are sponsoring the RSA, which is the Return Servicemen's Association here. So um, I've learnt my lesson now. Okay, if it makes a beep, turn it back on and hope for the best, and we'll splice it all together, and I'll work out how to turn off that function anyway um gallipoli was a battle in world war one in which the anzacs which is the australia new zealand army corps got completely hammered actually over in turkey and um <clears throat> uh we celebrate it every year it's quite a we have it's one of our national holidays and we have when i say celebrate it remember it remember it and all people who have been um, hurt and affected by war but what's interesting so um, obviously these socks are um, just lots of scraps um, but I did actually buy they have a range that the naturally um, will have a range of 
colours that are all the military colours from historical military colours. So this, um, my partner, I just did one last month uh, of 1915 uh, khaki, but they have Air Force and the and the berets and the yeah, just all sorts of and they're really quite fantastic colours. Um, anyway, just on without without the association association. Um, on, on the front of the, the label here, this, so this is the, the wall that goes with the pattern. Um, uh, we've got the uh, Australian, Turkish and the New Zealand flag. So what's happened obviously since, <laughs> since then is that uh, to, uh, we have a lot of graves over in Gallipoli and there's a service over there every year um, to commemorate those people who are buried over there. And there's a quote on the inside of the wall band. Um, which is um, from Mustafa Ataturk, founder of the Turkish Republic in 1934. And he said, Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us where they lie side by side in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Whew. So, yeah, I, I, a part of what makes me like to knit and to craft is this connection to history and to the mothers of history as well, particularly. It was my mother who taught me to knit. Um, and it really wasn't until she passed away two and a half years ago that I really took control of my knitting and stopped driving all the way to visit her whenever I dropped a stitch. Um, so now I, you know, but she she gave me that start and that hunger to make things with my hands um, from my childhood. And I really appreciate that. And yeah, the, so uh, these socks, I just, I just love it. Uh, and living in a small town, a rural town, somehow or other those historical, the historical and the military past, it's it's bigger. I think because all the families here, a lot of the families here have been here for generations and generations. And if you look at our local memorial, you'll recognise all the names and they're all the guys that, you know, their sons and grandsons and so on are people that I have drink beer with at the pub every week and um, so that's um, it, it's a bit more real out here I have to say and it is the last place that I have um, been singing as I, I like to sing at the Anzac service uh, because it feels like a gift and it doesn't feel like it's for me and that's a nice way of using your your training <laughs> so a lot of training but yeah uh, it's a nice way of using it and and offering it to people who wouldn't have that otherwise so yeah right um oh, f other finished objects around me there's something behind me but I am gonna have a sip of my drink because I keep holding it in my hand hopefully and then thinking when do you do this I guess you just make the entire internet wait which will be maybe one person but anyway hi one person watching me Mm -hmm. So, I had a friend who was becoming an uncle for the first time, and I said I'd make him something to gift. And I made this owl blanket, because I'd seen it on Ravelry, and I just thought it was the cutest thing. So, here we are. You see my little owls? Look at that! This is also... Oh, hi. It's quite big. <laughs> this is also made with uh, uh, naturally wool, uh, DK weight. Some of it, I'm pretty sure there is a stripe of this colour in my sock. Um, socks. Uh, yeah, so owls, play, uh, what's it called? Wise Owls, the pattern by Threads and Yarns of Pleasure, which I bought off Ravelry. Um, I, the wool is naturally loyal is the name of that line and the colour was missed and I embroidered the eyes and that's what it took the longest part actually <laughs> I was embroidering the eyes with wool left over from a, I made a tapestry glasses case um, last year one of the last lockdowns and um, 
and there was leftover wool, fine wool from that. So I just did random colours, just uh, random placements of orange, brown, and green for the eyes. It was very simple pattern. Um, it was really just three stitch little cables. I'm quite um, excited to hear that there is such a thing called a needleless cable or something. So I have to learn how to do that. I haven't yet, but I will uh, next time maybe. But uh, that's that one. It was. Um, I also learned that cabling um, pulls everything in, and this is definitely one of the first times when blocking has been an absolute godsend because I thought oh this looks terrible it was all wonky and because there's three sets of owls on one line and two sets on another and um, so it was all the the blanket was all like this on the edges and also too long that way um, compared to the width and I blocked it aggressively it's a term that I've heard <laughs> And um, it came out really well. I mean, it's just, and it's all, you know, drapey. I've learned all this since uh, listening over the last few months to other people's podcasts, all these words, um, ways of describing things. It's quite wonderful. So anyway, I'm looking forward to gifting that on to um, my friend who is, they've just bought a farm just an hour up the road. Um, so that's quite exciting for us because they were living eight hours away. Um, and uh, him and his partner have just bought a farm bigger and much more expensive than ours, um, <laughs> just up the road. And, uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to going in. And they moved in last weekend. Uh, so I'm going to go and visit them in the next week or two. And uh, then they can hand that on to niece or nephew. Oh, I think it's going to be a niece. Oh, that's the other thing. So this colour here, it's slightly blue. And at the time that I chose it, we didn't know whether it was a boy or a girl, and I wasn't really thinking about that. I just thought that's kind of like one of my favourite colours, and it looks so beautiful. It was very neutral, but I didn't want a white blanket. And yellow-green blankets, kind of like, mm, I don't know. Maybe green would have been safer. But anyway, I, I saw that colour. I thought it was beautiful, and I chose it. And then I was, um, I was doing my knitting at the pub, as I do, because I'm quite eccentric. And uh, someone said, oh, so it's obviously a boy. And I'm like... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. I wear more blue than pink myself, so, and I'm definitely a girl. I, th I, th I really think that's so outdated, and I really think it's got to stop this hyper gender divide of colours and clothes from prepubescent times like babies. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> yes, I, I, yeah, no. Um,. Warm and comfortable and loved and so on. Okay, I go with those concepts for, for clothing, but yeah, nothing else. Anyway, uh, around me. Oh, yes, one behind me. Ooh, this, I finished this, this this morning. Now, it hasn't been blocked, so it looks quite wonky. It's, be, it's being modelled for you by lamp right now. It's a... It's called, I think it's called Turner Square, this pattern by Jared Flood, uh, book, Brooklyn Tweeds pattern. I think I think it was free, the pattern. Anyway, it was a beginner pattern, which was terribly exciting because I started it yesterday and finished it this morning. <laughs> I like those. <laughs> that, that almost never happens. I'm getting, don't want to start a fire. And my camera went to sleep. Goodness knows. What's going on? So many things. Um, yeah, so we were living in a little cabin up the hill, and um, this abandoned villa, and it's a 130-year-old villa, was falling down on the edge of our property. There were sheep and birds and things living. It was open to the elements, and it was a mess. Really, really, really was a mess. And it's the second to last house on the way out of our village, and you have to drive past it and <laughs> it just made the it did make the place look very messy um anyway we we finally found the person that owned it and um bought it off him directly so i'm living in this villa which is very much a work in progress it's the biggest craft project we've got on the run at the moment hmm. it's midwinter here at the moment so now i'm we have a little shed out in the backyard with the toilet and shower in it and another shed on the side of the, the garage with a kitchen in it. 
none of these things have made it into the house yet <laughs> and it's really quite quite tiresome if you uh, are cooking at night and things when it's dark and you don't want to go out to the shed to do it and so on so yes looking forward to the, each new stage is really quite a celebration right I'm up to works in progress I always have a lot because Casting on new new projects is in a main. Oh no, I've got one more finished. Oh, I sort of finished, half finished. Oh, it's a work in progress, really. Let's start with this one. So, um, one of the ladies, uh, a lady that I work for in town, owns the pub. Um, she has a little granddaughter who's 15 months, and she has also also has a luxury house in the Marlborough Sounds, and which she's offered to lend us for four days for my daughter's 21st. So we're going on a holiday, and as a thank you, I thought I'd make the granddaughter a little jersey. Um, it's probably not going to fit her this year, but I, <laughs> I decided to make a flax. Oh, colour's blowing out, it's very white. Um, flax jersey. I, the only reason I've got it in this natural white colour is I was given this puppy, and so I decided to use it. Um, because I like using what I already have. So I, I held that double with a single strand of mohair, silk mohair, which I had, uh, which I got from this amazing place that supplies me with bits and bobs called Knit and Stitch. Um, shout out to Knit and Stitch. They now they now obviously recognise me because I shop there so often. There's just a, only, only a, a few supplies of chalgu needles in New Zealand, so you end up having to go back to you know going back to the same retailers all the time and I, I've certainly never I, I, because I live out in the Watts um, I only would occasionally have access to the most basic big box craft supply places and yes certainly not the kind of places that supply Chalgo interchangeables or even or wool with possum or anything useful like that anyway so i made the little flax jersey which uh will probably fit her next year but the, it's not quite finished yet because i'm going to i have a little swatch and as soon as i finish this i'm going to be doing some duplicate uh, practicing duplicate stitch of i want to do three little sheep across the bottom uh, and I've got I've got the little graphs and there's a sheep looking to the left and a sheep looking straight ahead and then there's a drunk sheep <laughs> which is upside down which I thought was quite appropriate seeing as they own the pub um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just having a little bit of a, a moral dilemma as whether I do them all the same color or whether I do one of them or two of them pink and the other one's gray but they have to be Suffolk sheep but of course, Suffolk sheep are actually white with black faces and black legs, um, which are, is the kind of sheep I have out the window out here. But I can't do that because I've done a, the whole jersey white. It's going to be a little bit rustic, so hopefully she's not fussy about scratchy wool. But you know, it's the thought that counts. And hopefully, they can just wear a, a skivvy under it, and hopefully she'll be fine. She, she does already, I mean, she's 15 months, so she, she's just tottering around the place. Um, and she does wear a woolly jersey at the moment, but I did notice that it was a bit tight. That one's not going to fit, so who knows? I do my best. Okay, another thing, I have work in progress here. Um, I bought very cheaply, oh, I'm blowing out high. The sun's catching up with me. It's coming around. Oh, uh, too late. Uh, I bought these cones. Two cones of wool. Lace weight. Okay. It's more burgundy than that. That looks really quite brilliantly ready pink on there. It's quite... I like the colour on it on the screen. I wonder if it'll come up like that a bit if I wash it. Anyway, it's a lace weight luxury angora. 70% uh, lamb's wool, 20% angora, and 10% nylon, 2 ply, 400 grams. Right, so I've, I bought two cones of that, two 400 gram cones. They're both brand new. They've obviously been sitting in someone's cupboard for a good 20 years because they smell of dust. And I cannot, when I knit with it, I, can, I just can't wait to finish the object and wash it. <laughs> Make it smell like wool wash instead of... Uh, 
dust. But anyway, that's all right. I'm holding it double and making a, oh, is it Isabel Kramer Yume? Yeah, so that's me thinking about summer knits really for next summer. Um, it has been, it's actually sitting on stoppers at the moment because I keep needing the needles for something else. Um, and this is quite slow uh, for me. Uh, just because every time I come around, do a round, I end up with the wrong stitch count. And you're holding a lace weight double. So you can't really see very much of that. But, oh, it smells so bad. <laughs> oh, I don't mind the smell of sheep, but the smell of sort of old dust is like, mm. anyway, it'll be fine. It'll be fine when it's washed. So that, that's where I've started. It's all curling at the at the neck and things. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for the best. I'm just hoping for the best. Uh, but yes, it's quite that's quite slow going and it keeps getting put aside. I guess because it's the middle of winter and I, at the moment I just have got very excited about making gifts for people. Um, so I just keep churning out socks and hats and things. So another thing, another whip that's sitting here and is also so I have that one's really only just started the yoke but I have two other whips here which are both quite close to finished so what I have a, a tendency of doing is starting something new like I've just finished that hat which I only started yesterday and I did that because I just finished doing the eyes on the owls etc so I just you always want to start something new. It's terribly exciting. <laughs> Starting something new. But what I do is tend to have, uh, try and finish off something as well, if that makes sense. So I think, I think this will be the next, no, no, the other one will be my next finish off. So this one's probably going to sit here for another week or two. But I've just got one sleeve to go. And this is, Oh, my partner's just home, and uh, he's probably going to interrupt. So if I pause, I'll have a little chat with him, send him on his way, and um, come back to you. But I have, this is hand-spun alpaca, which I have, I spun a single ply, as fine as I could manage at the time with my skills, which is like this. So it's probably, looks at like about a sport weight. Yeah, and I was a bit worried about that not being strong enough, so I either could have double, like, uh, applied it with something else, or uh, I bought, this is the, this is what I held, oh no, the sun, hang on, I'm going to pause it and move, oh, okay, oh, still a little bit too much light, sorry about that, it's just, you know, New Zealand sun, middle of winter, what can I say, at least it's not blowing, yesterday, you know, Power lines were blowing down, trees were blowing over the road. And um, so I'm just looking at a sheep lying down thinking, too early for lambs? Yes, let's be having a nap, hopefully. Right, um, so I held my alpaca, white alpaca, with this single strand of um, silk mohair. So 20% silk, 80% mohair. Um, I got a single strand because I thought at some point I might, I, I bought four skeins of this, I'd never seen it for sale as a single, and thinking that um, I might ply, I just held it together for this, my favourite thing, sweater, or no, yeah, my favourite thing, sweater number one, and I just held, held it double, but I quite like to see what it's like to ply it with my own wool, and, or, and, and maybe dye it, I don't know, you know. Every project, you know, you're always adding some new skill that you haven't tried before. But this one, so this is my favourite thing. So it's been a long push because I think it's going to look awful. <laughs> In fact, I'm pretty sure it's going to look awful. So I, I made the largest size because I'm, yeah, probably in the largest size. But, um, and it's going to be quite sheer, so I'll have to wear a, a lace cami or something underneath it um but so there's one sleeve so they've got it's got three quarter sleeves 
I don't know, I just think it's going to stretch, it's got, and it's going to sort of just look like a large white balloon really. I, I think um, it's actually one of the things I do struggle with, like, and I have to say the knitting sort of pattern selling community is quite divided in this, and I really enjoy Ravelry for the fact that anyone can put their project, the pictures of their projects of that pattern up. And what you get is this input of fantastically ordinary people wearing their wonderful creations with their own creativity put in it, and their own bodies, and their own marvellously terrible photography. And that's so much easier to see the aspects of the pattern and whether you think they'll work for you than like petite knit I mean she's so tiny and not that's fine she's she's gorgeous and she suits all her stuff but it just makes me worry about whether how it's going to look on everyone else when only and the same with Andrew Maori she's so beautiful and you're just like which is great and obviously you know, you want good photos up there, but when it's always one person with one body type and one body shape, you sit there and go, oh, I'm trying to decide whether I buy this pattern or not, but it's from looking at a photo of someone who just doesn't look like me at all. And it's, I mean, it's a lesson, isn't it? If you're, the, if, you, if they vary, vary their models. <laughs> Um, and I, I know there's a, there's a lovely sense of consistency in, in their presentation of their patterns, but actually when I'm buying a pattern, I want pattern. I'm not buying, because, you know, I have to do something else if I want to look like Andrea Murray, and I think that involves some diet and exercise. Um, and, yeah, I don't. Anywho, um, yeah, so, so the same here with us. I, I think, you know, like the, the pictures of my favourite things are often, like, uh, patterns are often you know, hanging on a coat hanger, and it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting, so, uh, although that said, I have faith, because I was watching another random video on, um, I like watching vintage uh, sewers making, you know, vintage, vintage patterns and things, and there was a, a woman I was watching this morning, and she was talking about the flapper era, and the effect of um, flapper undergarments on trying to create and she was quite a curvy woman and she was um, yeah just showing the effect oh, she had a black uh, satin dress on um, slip dress on and she had just showed her, or, her with her ordinary underwear and then all these different garments that were for sale at the time and the effect they had on creating that sort of flat straight up and down boyish 1920s figure and it was like whoa it had a huge effect um, it was really quite fascinating um, and she she made them herself which is also <laughs> that was super clever and fun to watch but you never know I might be able to make it work but I will finish this sleeve at some point it's very 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 soft and yeah and I could always dye it also I'm a bit worried about the color because which you can't really see here because you probably can if I show you the two balls of wool that I'm I'm using. So, you know, here's the, the very white commercially produced mohair silk. That's white. And then I'm holding it with my natural... I don't know how to do that. There we are. No, we aren't. See, other people... Yeah, I watched them do this. Is this a thing? Oh, it is a thing. Look at that. Oh, these are things I've watched and learned. Um, yeah, that, that's the natural cut white colour of the alpaca, which is quite white, but it's not really white. So, yeah, it just kind of looks a little bit grubby, I guess. So, you know, I could dye it blue or something. Green. Could do with a green sweater. And that might make it look more interesting, at least like a large white fluffy balloon. Who knows? You know, you add the balloon sleeves and things to it, and it's like, yeah. And, like, back in the old days when I was skinny, I would have put it with a very, very fitted pencil skirt or something, and it would have been fine to have a baggy top. But we don't do that anymore. We do comfort. All right, last whip I'm going to show you today. 
this one has a, the wool has a special story. So when I was 14, my mum knitted me a lace jersey. Um, and I still wear it. And I've worn it every season in the... Is it 35 years? Oh my god. 35 years since then, I have worn it every season. Just starting to look a little cropped now for my personal style but uh, and size and shape. But hmm, I'm actually thinking, seeing as I've still got the wool, <laughs> that I could uh, try and lengthen it. There's a thought. Anyway, excuse me. I keep burping. It's not very polite. Um... She passed away, as I said, a couple, uh, two and a half years ago, and this was in her stash. I basically went into her stash. She kind of got, she'd stopped knitting it towards the end. She was 81. Um, but she, um, in the last lot of big push of knitting she'd done was uh, a lot of toys. So there was a lot of bright coloured acrylics. And I just, I don't do acrylic. In fact, I, I only really discovered after I bought that, Angora lamb's wool lace weight stuff online that it was uh, had nylon in it. I, I just avoid it. I just I just think we've lived this many centuries without plastic in our in our wool. We can carry on. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> plus the uh, the New Zealand uh, wool industry is is really struggling. The farmers get nothing for their wool compared to the cost of shearing, and you know it's just. It's so time-consuming, that's the thing, and it's all been replaced by making clothes out of polar fleece, which is plastic, isn't it? And then, you know, and then we all think that's great, we chuck it all in a washing machine, and then we discover that it's all getting into our fish and into our drinking water. Mm. I just, sometimes, slow is better. It is the life I like to live slow life. Anywho, I decided I needed to, I had, she had this cone left of this wool that she's kept for the 35 years since or whatever it was at that time, 33, and uh, so I thought I'd give myself, give a go at knitting lace. This is first ever try at knitting lace. Um, I did. Okay, <laughs> I'm having so many technical issues with my camera. I haven't worked out how to use it yet. Uh, but anyway, I'll hopefully be able to fix it all up later. Anyway, here's my lace. My lace scarf oh, with random attached pieces of orange wool. Um, this is a free pattern by Kaylee Harris called Lace Leaf Scarf. Now this is a, a, I don't even know what kind of wool this is. I think it's cashmere, but I don't know. Um, I really... Obviously the cone many years ago lost its label. Um, <clears throat> I do know from wearing a jersey made out of it um, for decades <laughs> that it's very warm and very light, surprisingly warm. So again, this is coming up very red and it's actually a kind of... Mm, it's, it's pinker. It, it's really... A pink colour. Can you see? Probably not. I've had the camera stop a couple of times, so I'm losing my confidence with my technology. <laughs> oh, you wait till I try and edit it. I'm not going to do that today. No, I'm going to go and have a stiff cup of tea and uh, a bit of a nap, I think, after this. Anyway, it's supposed to look like leaves. And it's going to be, I'm just going to knit until most of this cone is gone, I think. So I, I think the, the average scarf length is supposed to be a metre 60. It's probably nearly there. Nearly there. It's taken me a long time. I keep making mistakes. It's quite hard to fix the mistakes. And then I realised you couldn't tell. So basically... Most rows, I count up stitches and go, oh, look at that, I've got one too many or two not enough, and I just kind of fudge it and fix it. As long as I haven't got masses of dropped stitches, it's fine. So there's a few wonky leaves in there, but I don't think anyone's going to look closely enough to care. And if they do care, they're just not my kind of person. 
<laughs> because the point is I'm making something. I'm making something that matters. And it's going to be pretty. And it's from wool that my mum had made something for me when I was 14. And that's kind of special, you know. It's, I, li I love throwing effort at a bag of wool full of poo and grass and turning it into something functional. I mean, how amazing is that? It's such a gift. So anyway, you probably get the idea of the kind of um, person I am and how I express myself. I, I love watching, I mean, I've been watching, who are the guys, you know, Max and Vincent and uh, Jonathan Day and, and uh, uh, you know, Lizzie from Hive Knits. And I've, what, I've been watching these people and there's all these brands, uh, there's a lot of brands of the wool and it's all quite luxurious and it's all like I'm getting the correct wool for the pattern design. And I, I get that, I get that being a hobby. Um, I guess my approach to life, having always lived on the smell of an oily rag, um, is to throw effort at whatever resources I have around me and see what I can do. By the time I've finished making the quilt that's sitting on the floor at my feet and, and making the project bag that's sitting over there in a pile ready to go and, you know, renovating, finishing renovating the cupboard, my craft cupboard behind me, which I've done half of and not the rest of. By the time I've finished all those jobs, perhaps I can worry about buying, you know, some, some fancy wool brands. But at, at this stage, I am enjoying making something good out of something that would otherwise be thrown away. That is, yeah, I guess I, I've always had slight depression era, era thinking. And um, yeah, so that, that, that's, that's my thing. Um, in terms of what projects I have planned up, I, I tend to, um, I have a lot of things on a list in my head. But then every time I finish a project, I then allow myself to go, what do I want? What do I want to do now? And I know in the last few days I've suddenly got obsessed with the sea glass tea, uh, sea glass sweater. Um, and uh, I'm thinking I might start something like that. But at the same time, I don't have enough scraps because I don't keep scraps. I use them. I use them on things like socks. Um, and the other thing about being a spinner is you tend to only make what you need because <laughs> it takes so long. Um, so you don't end up with a lot of scraps there. What I've got is a big fadge and lots of sacks of wool, but I don't have made up wool that needs to be knitted necessarily. Well, there's a sheep looking at me and it's exactly the same pattern as the one I'm about to embroider duplicate stitch onto the little jersey, white jersey for the girl. She's just like, yeah, anyway. It's not the one lying down. She's still asleep. Uh, right, so that's me. I do, um, uh, yeah, I guess I, I, um, I, I really want to balance out my selfish knitting with gifts. And also I probably need to sell one or two pieces because I do need to make some money back for all the time. I, and um, I spend all my spending money on things for knitting. Um, even though I don't buy a lot of expensive wool yet. Maybe one day, but uh, yet I don't. So yeah, commission gifts, uh, commission knits, I, I've got one or two of those that I need to get on with. Um, and items for sale. Just did my first one this morning. <laughs> uh, difficult and easy patterns, you know, you're always trying to mix that up with your selfish knitting and so on. And also, I like to have one thing on the run that requires me to spin all the time, um, at least. So the knitting's obviously faster than than spinning and knitting. It sort of triples the time it takes to create something. So, um, and I just, I do like, I guess I'm a product knitter. I like to churn them out and I like to take the photo and go, right, done that. That part of that person's body is now warm, sorted. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thank you for joining me on my little quest to make the whole world have warm feet, hands, heads, and bodies, and, uh, and maybe beautiful, beautiful bits and pieces for my home and so on. And um, I'm really looking forward to sharing more 
of what I do with you and, and how that journey rolls and how it sort of keeps me calm and, and happy. So, uh, yeah, if you like what you see, do the subscribe thing. I have no idea how, I'm, how to even upload a video to YouTube yet, so we'll find out and hopefully you know what you're doing at your end. And um, maybe I'll see you next time. Bye.